Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome virtually to the Thomas Welch Library here in Leesburg, Virginia. My name is Nora Schneider. I am the Library Genealogy Associate here at Thomas Welch Library. We're excited to welcome you this afternoon to our virtual event with Andrew Jampoler, Voyage Through an Enchanted Land. I'm going to hand it right over to Andrew Jampoler so he can start talking to you about this very, very interesting research topic. Andy, take it away. Thanks very much. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking for a little while this afternoon about a really quite remarkable expedition conducted by the United States Navy or members of the United States Navy in uh, mid 19th century uh, down the Amazon River. Uh, 1851, 52 are the dates. And if you'll bear with me, we'll walk through that uh, process uh, and, and get started. Uh, this is the second of three lectures that I'll be giving uh, at the Bolsch Library. The next one will come up uh, on November 17th. It's the story of a light ship, a light ship cross rip caught in the ice in 1918, dragged out to sea. And it's the fascinating story of what happened during that historic gold freeze in the New England winter of 1918. But today we're talking about something much warmer uh, and longer ago, uh, the expedition uh, down the Amazon River. A little context, a little historical background. Approaching mid-century, the United States fights the Mexican-American War under President Polk against the Mexicans. It's quite frankly a land grab. It's designed to uh, substantially enlarge the U.S. and it shall. If you'll look at the map on the top left of your screen, you'll notice uh, the states, uh, the extent of the states of Mexico and the ambitions of the United States were basically to uh, take over that territory uh, to uh, all the way through the Pacific. Naval expeditions worked along the uh, Gulf of Mexico coast and also assaulted uh, parts of Mexico and the Pacific. And the army uh, moved against the Mexican army and the Mexican emperor at the time. Uh, the result was uh, an American victory and a land grab, very substantial land grab this is the map uh, President Polk sent to Congress in 1848, uh, describing his ambitions, his interests uh, in the West, in what was uh, Mexico at the time. And this map shows how he proposed to apportion the former Mexican territory into the United States, now extending all the way to the Pacific uh, in, these, uh, in these regions right here where the uh, uh, the arrow is dancing. So Polk sends his message saying, here's what he wants to do. Over in the bottom right, you see where the military activity took place, mostly uh, right here on the uh, in Mexico, but also along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific as well. When that war ends, there is sort of a dead period uh, for another 20 years or so until the Civil War begins, which obviously nobody would call a dead period during which the United States Navy casts about looking for things to do. Now, it has six small squadrons at sea in the various waters of the world, but an opportunity opens up in the 1850s, 60s, uh, up to the war. An opportunity opens up for ambitious people, interested people, uh, enthusiastic people to explore the world by sea. And the U.S. Navy supports a number of expeditions uh, during these years. Uh, we'll go through from top to bottom here, the South Seas Exploring Expedition under Charles Wilkes, an expedition, quite remarkable one, we'll talk about a little bit more, uh, to the River Jordan and the Dead Sea under Lieutenant William Lynch, an astronomical expedition to Chile collecting uh, scientific data, not just astronomical data, but a broad variety of agricultural and other scientific data under James Gillis, a very substantial exploring and surveying naval expedition from 50 to 56. First under uh, Commodore Ringgold, he loses his job. He's relieved of command in, in Hong Kong, perhaps for insanity, and replaced by John Rogers. And the expedition that you uh, and I probably know the best, it's uh, Commodore Perry's opening of Japan, the Empire of Japan, 1852-54. The famous black ships arriving offshore Japan and forcing it into uh, the 19th and uh, very soon into the 20th century. 
Uh, we'll go through these one by one very quickly. But what I want to do is show you where the expedition to the Valley of the Amazon fits in. And it fits in right here uh, between the astronomical collections of data in Chile and between the North Pacific expeditions of the United States. And this will be an absolutely fascinating trip collecting data and doing other things uh, through the valley, end to end, through the enormous valley of the Amazon. There are uh, a number of exploring and surveying expeditions, 38 to 42. The principal players are, of course, the presidents. You see the presidents there. And you see also the secretaries of the Navy, uh, Dickerson here, and the Secretary of War, Poinsett. The exploring, the USXX, the exploring expedition is a substantial fleet. Uh, they will be very determinedly exploring the Pacific and the Southern Pacific and, and distant waters, a fleet of six or seven ships. This illustration in the bottom left is a picture of that fleet that was used uh, to illustrate Nathaniel Philbrick's excellent book on the subject. Uh, the exploring expedition's route will take them down off of, uh, out of South, uh, South America, off the waters of Antarctica, in between uh, the tip of South America and the Antarctic continent, in between Australia and the Antarctic continent as well, following an elaborate round the world track. You see that track laid out here and continuing on through one of the great exploring expeditions. The documentation of this is very substantial. This is uh, the original publication in five volumes published by the famous Philadelphia Scientific Publishing House, Lee and Blanchard. The photo, or the painting rather, on the bottom right is that of Charles Wilkes, who led that expedition. Uh, brilliant success, enormous collection of data. Uh, Nathaniel Philbrick has written what I think is the best popular book on the subject called Sea of Glory. You see the book cover there uh, in black and red. But there are other sources as well, and you see the other titles as well, too. I invite you to read one or another of them if uh, you're interested in what the United States was doing in this era. One of the stranger of the United States Navy's expeditions was in 1848, an expedition to the River Jordan and the Dead Sea conducted by Lieutenant William Lynch. Uh, the portrait there of Lynch is from the Museum of the Confederacy. He was a Southerner. Lynch determines and asks the Secretary of the Navy to approve, who does, Lynch determines to go to the Dead Sea and to explore it. It is uh, an area that has fascinated people uh, in previous decades, previous centuries. It is known to be a strange body of water, distinctive for many reasons, not the least of which is the understanding is that it's not at sea level. It's understood not to be at sea level, but rather below. And the mystery of that uh, among other things, draws Lynch to appeal to the Navy to permit an expedition to explore the Dead Sea, and that's proved. The expedition will have several fascinating features, one of which is they will carry two metal boats, metal boats that have to be riveted together to be used, and these boats will take the expedition members across the Sea of Tiberias, which is to say the Sea of Galilee, down the full length of the Jordan River and onto the Dead Sea for a very important expedition, exploring first what is the level of the Dead Sea, and second, the character and nature of the sea. These boats, built by a, a man named William Francis, designed by Francis, will later become famous lifeboats. The a picture you see at the bottom is the Francis Metallic Life Car. There's one of these in the Smithsonian Museum's collection. And these were lifeboats used to help ships in, in distress and extremis offshore. They would run these lifeboats out on the line, load four people at a time lying thrown in them, and bring them back. And the fascinating feature of these boats is they're built in metal halves under that uh, hydraulic press that you see there pictured on the right. Lynch's expedition and USS Supply will arrive on the coast after getting permission from the Ottoman Sultan to do this, will arrive on the coast, proceed from the coast inland to the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias then, where they will test their boats. This is, remember now, 1848. They will proceed down the River Jordan, many days down the River Jordan, 
to the Dead Sea and then conduct explorations of the sea, determining its character, its depth, its salinity, the nature of the bottom, and having very carefully surveyed along this whole track, they will establish the elevation of the Dead Sea uh, quite accurately. Lynch has a very particular motive for this exercise, and that motive has nothing to do with the scientific exploration of the sea. These are illustrations from his report, illustrations of his camp, uh, camp at, uh, here on the side of the, uh, the Dead Sea. He called it Camp Washington. It's at, the, it's at Angiti now. This is a demonstration of the very careful surveying they did to establish the elevation of the mountains between the coast and, and the Sea of Galilee and the River Jordan, and an illustration of the descent down the Jordan. What you see here from his book is a drawing of the Dead Sea that reflects each of the points along the zigzag here, each of the points at which they sounded the depth of the bottom and collected a sample of the bottom. In, in a more modern illustration, you can see the hydraulic research uh, that was done to establish the depth of the Dead Sea and the character of the bottom. This was exceedingly important for Lynch because it was his motive for this trip. Lynch's purpose, private purpose, was to establish the absolute truth of the book of Genesis. And he thought he could do this by locating the five cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the others, that were destroyed by the wrath of God. And it was his conclusion that he found those cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, interestingly enough, on the southern point of the Dead Sea. And he concluded that they were there submerged in these waters by the wrath of God because the southern body of the Dead Sea is so much shallower than the rest of the sea. So it was his judgment that he had succeeded in proving the literal truth of the book of Genesis and his motive for having conducted this expedition. As you might suspect, there are a number of sources on this as well. There's a very good one by Professor Chaim Gorham, uh, a professor at a university in Israel. Uh, there's not a bad one by, by me called Sailors in the Holy Land some years ago describing the 1848 American expedition to the Dead Sea and the search for Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lynch, of course, wrote up his expedition in great detail, published again by Leon Blanchard, and it's popular to see that. It, it's possible to see that. 1849-1852, the Navy's Bureau of Charts and a Depot of Charts and Instruments launches an investigation, an astronomical investigation to Chile under uh, James Melvin Gillis. The purpose of that uh, astronomical uh, investigation is to take some sun lines from a specific latitude, sun elevations from a specific latitude, to pair those elevations with same observations of the sun taken from the latitude in the northern hemisphere and to using a geometry of sorts to establish the solar distance, how far away exactly the planet was from the sun. The expedition will also can collect all kinds of uh, agricultural seeds, agricultural products and produce uh, as part of a general interest in what is going on in the southern continent and how it reflects and the biology of the northern continent as well. This is an illustration of the telescope that the Chilean Observatory will use, an illustration from a, a report on the subject of this, from the summit of uh, the mountain on which the uh, telescope was mounted. And here's some other uh, drawings from that illustration. The purpose of this was not simply scientific. They were collecting all kinds of agricultural products but they were also exploring and, and investigating Chilean society, South American society, and life uh, on that continent more generally. The impetus behind that investigation and the impetus of much of the scientific research that went on in the Navy was centered on the Naval Observatory, uh, the Bureau of Charts and Instruments, uh, founded by James Melville Gillis. There he is on the left, and soon led uh, by its most famous uh, scientist, its most famous leader, Matthew Fontaine Maury, the first superintendent of the United States Naval Observatory. There's Maury uh, on the right. His will be the inspiration behind the conduct of the expedition 
that I'll be describing to you. He is the father of the idea. Uh, he is the politician who will move it through Washington and get it funded. He is the recruiter who will select his brother-in-law to conduct this enormously important uh, expedition and to execute its private purpose beyond its purely scientific purposes. Uh, Maori will have a private purpose that he instructs his brother-in-law at great length about, and we'll talk about here in just a moment. There's another expedition going on at the same time, the famous North Pacific Exploring and Surveying Expedition, led first by Cadwallader Ringgold. He is relieved of command in Hong Kong. It's suspected that he is uh, insane and replaced by Rogers. This is an expedition that will go throughout the Pacific. And, and I, I'm sorry that you can't see uh, the track of the expedition. These arrows here describe, but they will get as far north as the uh, as the Ar Arctic Sea, as the uh, as the Gulf here, uh, the Sea of Japan, down along the coast, throughout the North Pacific. This expedition will sail, collecting astronomical and scientific and other data. Uh, but specifically focused uh, up here on, uh, on these northern waters. The expedition I mentioned to you last in this list of, of other events going on, one way we're, we're focusing on, is the famous one of Matthew Perry opening Japan, opening the uh, empire of Japan to Western presence, Western commerce, uh, global attention. Uh, the illustration there shows the the black ships of his fleet steaming towards Japan. Uh, the caption says, uh, bringing the gospel of God to the heathens. The Japanese marvel at, at what appears off offshore. The illustration in the top right is, is a Japanese illustration of what these steamers uh, from the American Navy looked like to them. Uh, if you look at it for just a moment, you see the crew swinging through the rigging steam belching out of the stacks, the figurehead on the front looking like uh, uh, it's ready to devour something, uh, and there are the paddle wheels churning the ocean into foam, the way in which uh, these ships will move to and from uh, Japanese waters. This is a, another a view of that same expedition. This is from a Japanese perspective. Uh, it is uh, painted in 1889. It represents the samurai of Japan defending the homeland, uh, the Japanese homeland from Perry. And there is his fleet lying offshore, intimidating fleet lying offshore. The drawing of Japan into modern uh, society, modern technology, will be astonishingly quick. Uh, whatever Perry might have thought of the empire of Japan, in a short 50 years, that empire will take on and easily defeat two separate Russian fleets during the Russo-Japanese War. They will defeat a Russian fleet uh, based here in the Pacific, in the North Pacific. And weeks later, as the Russian Baltic fleet steams around uh, the continent uh, to get into Japanese waters, the Japanese will defeat that fleet as well. This is a illustration of the Russo-Japanese War. You see Russia represented by the bear, uh, the Japanese standing here. And it is astonishing how successfully they will defeat what is up until then been regarded as a modern power. Okay, with that as a background, let's turn to the expedition that you and I have come here for, which is the expedition exploring the Valley of the Amazon. The reports are available at the uh, National Archives or online in, in readable form. I have written a short article in Naval History Magazine, you see the cover there, uh, on the same story. And there's uh, more to come in resources and reports. The idea, the origin of the idea is Matthew Fontaine Maury who is at that time the head of the observatory, just the, the new head of the observatory, and he is arguably the first oceanographer in history. Now there's, there's uh, Humboldt, the German uh, scientist, is a candidate for that title also, but I think most people will concede 
that Maori was the first oceanographer. There's a really excellent book uh, uh, about Maori. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Tracks in the Sea. Maori was an author, extensive author. He is the subject in the left-hand corner of this slide. He is the subject of a statue uh, at the Naval Academy uh, commemorating his status as, uh, as an oceanographer. Maori is born in Spotsylvania in 1806. He will serve at the Naval Observatory uh, through the 40s and into the 60s. Uh, he will publish a book called The Physical Geography of the Seas in 55, 1855. It is this book that grants him the credit of being the first oceanographer. Uh, as, a, as a Southerner, he resigns in 1861, a few days after the Confederacy withdraws from the Union and joins the Confederate Navy. He will serve in England for the Confederate Navy uh, in 1862. Uh, we'll talk about his thoughts in 1865 about Mexico. Uh, he will serve as a professor uh, in, uh, at VMI, Virginia Military Institute, in 72, and he will die in 73. Uh, the charts to the right are just representative of, of oceanographic studies that he was conducting. It is Maori's great genius to realize that in the logbooks preserved at the Naval Observatory, it's oceanographic data that can be analyzed, evaluated, put into tables, and used to develop sailing directions, modern sailing directions for the period for sailing vessels. Those data will report on winds and currents by latitude and longitude throughout the seasons of the year. And the application of those data to sailing instructions, to sailing directions for merchantmen and, and naval vessels as well, will permit significant economies, significant savings in time and money, in great passages across the ocean by taking advantage of the, of the currents and of the regular winds that Maori discovers by perusing the logbooks held in his archive. I mentioned to you that Maori is a Southerner, and he has uh, an interesting motive for the expedition that he will send, uh, successfully uh, send into the Amazon. And that motive uh, can be read in one of two ways. He is concerned about the preservation of the plantation economy in the South, uh, both uh, concerned by its, its size, its sustainability, and concerned about, as a Southerner, about obvious pressures uh, against slavery. And he concludes from, from his thinking that there is in the Valley of the Amazon the possibility of, on the one hand, sort of a safety net, a place where Confederate plantation owners can move their plantations together with their slaves and continue the economy that plantations represent and the society that is a consequence of what he describes delicately as compulsory labor. So either in the possibility that slavery will be rejected or ejected from the United States, or in the simple possibility that the plantations of the South will expand to their maximum limit and natural increase will require other land and other resources for the preservation of this agricultural system and social structure, Maori looks at South America and specifically at the Valley of the Amazon as a natural twin a sister uh, to the American South and as a candidate to recreate the plantation economy of the South elsewhere, easily connected to the economy of the American South by the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean and the currents and winds that make travel back and forth from the Southern American continent to the Valley of the Amazon easy and economical and reliable. So his motives are more than simply the collection of information about this vast drainage basin. He has a very specific political and economic motive as well.
This illustration here on the left shows you the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, and it is his view, based on his, his uh, oceanographic knowledge, it is his view that this is a very natural connection between this agricultural region here and the region that he thinks is represented by the Amazon drainage basin. So he will send this expedition. His motive will be to see how these can be coupled socially, politically, and economically. But just for, for background information, this is the pattern of slave trading from Africa uh, to the Americas. And it is, as I suggested to you just a minute ago, very much in his thoughts as he lays out to naval leadership his concept of an exploration of the valley of the Amazon. It's not through its economic and social goals that he has in mind that this will be sold, but rather by its role as uh, a participant in the world economy. Maori will select for this job, for the leadership of this uh, of this expedition, even before the Navy has approved it, he will privately select his brother-in-law, Herndon. Uh, the list on the left shows you uh, Maori's uh, biography again, so to speak, and it will show you where the Herndon expedition fits in and the death of Herndon in, uh, uh, in 57. Herndon, as I say, is his brother-in-law. Uh, he will receive an enormous essay, pages and pages long from Maori, a secret essay. Maori will encourage Herndon to say nothing to anybody about this, describing what it is Maori intends to accomplish by persuading the Navy to send an expedition down the Amazon River, uh, collecting information, collecting specimens, and collecting samples. Uh, a moment on the Amazon. Uh, this on the left is uh, an overhead shot, a satellite view of, of that part of uh, South America, the Amazon drainage basin. That drainage basin is almost 2.4 million square miles. It is an enormous riverine system. Out several hundred miles to sea from the mouth of the Amazon, it is possible to pick up brackish water, which is to say not salt water, not fresh water, but a mix of the two, hundreds of miles out to sea as a result of the drainage from this part of the continent. The chart on the right compares in several dimensions uh, the great rivers of the world in length, in water discharge, in the amount of sediment carried, and in the size of the drainage basin. And here is the Amazon uh, compared to the Nile, the Mississippi, the Yangtze, the Huang Ho, the, the Shang, uh, the Brahmaputra, and the Ganges. And I'll show you what these things mean in a moment. This line here is a comparison of the length of the rivers, and it'll give you an idea. It is not as long as the Nile, but it is longer than, than the others, and significantly so uh, over the Mississippi. The next dimension, the width on this graph, shows you the amount of water discharged. And it's absolutely clear that there is no rival uh, to the Amazon in terms of water discharge uh, into, the, into the oceans. The next, uh, the thickness of this uh, chart shows you the sediment carried, an enormous mass of sediment carried by the river, although not so great as, for instance, the Huang Ho or the Ganges. And finally, the size of the drainage basin. I mentioned to you that the Amazon's drainage basin is almost uh, two and a half million square miles, 2.4 million actually, and by far the largest of any, uh, any river in the world. This is the Mississippi's drainage basin up here on the top left. I've overlaid the, the silhouette of the United States on top of Northern South America. This is the Amazon's drainage basin, and it is almost the size of the lower 48 states. An illustration of that drainage basin uh, showing most of the river systems that, that feed into the Amazon is here on the right-hand side. Another view of this is shows you land use, and this is a little out of date, but not much. And it's uh, densely vegetated. It's land that's been cleared for pasture, uh, areas that flood, 
bare ground for farmland, desert areas down in here. And what it shows you is the agricultural richness, the biological richness of the drainage basin. This basin is under tremendous attack now in a number of ways. And there's great fearfulness that we're, we're witnessing, we're living in the era where the Amazon forest will be progressively and more rapidly destroyed. That's a modern problem and has nothing to do with the expedition. Maori's goals were very specific. He was looking for a way to connect the market and the productivity of the Mississippi and, and the Amazon. He was looking for an area that possibly could become a homeland for the migration of plantation agriculture. And he was looking for a place that could become a political refuge in the event that that homeland was necessary. The quotation here that you see, I care not what may be the motive which prompts the government to send you there. He's writing uh, to uh, Herndon. Your going is to be the first link in the chain, which is to end in the establishment of the Amazonian Republic. This is in the secret instructions that he uh, sent to his kinsmen while he is working in the city of Washington to get the Navy's permission to accomplish this mission and to get the Navy's funding to do it. Expedition goals, as passed on uh, to uh, Herndon, were the, uh, here on the right, I can read it to you, but you can read it to yourself. The goal is having to do with agriculture, the fact that the Valley of the Amazon and the Mississippi, in his mind, were sort of sister places, sister economies, sister geography. And finally, that civilization would be advanced by the introduction of Americans and American slaves into this area that he believed was peopled uh, by inferior types across the board. Secretary of the Navy Graham, President Fillmore, uh, are presented the proposals to conduct this expedition and the Secretary of the Navy approves them and sends them by letter uh, to Herndon. Uh, there are goals in all these areas, agricultural, a collection of data on climate and weather, on the collection of information on the resources, and scientific goals as well, as much, including a, even a census of the area. Riding in USS Vandalia, Herndon uh, arrives in Chile in August 1850, and he will there remain for a period of months waiting for the arrival of the official instructions from the Secretary of the Navy to build his ex to, uh, to conduct that expedition. This is the ship that delivers him uh, to the west coast of South America, Vandalia. She, some years later, in 1889, will be one of the vessels, uh, sloops of war, uh, destroyed in the great tempest at Appius Samoa, uh, which wipes out, this is a picture of the destruction after that tempest. But uh, in, in the period we're talking about, uh, she is a capable, recently rearmed, recently enlarged sailing vessel, and she will deliver these two men to the west coast of South America to prepare for the expedition. While Herndon is waiting for official instructions from the Secretary of the Navy, remember all he has is from his kinsman, while he's waiting for those instructions in Lima from August through May, uh, he conducts what amounts to a sort of a sociological inspection of, of Peru and of Lima specifically. Uh, these are illustrations that emerge from that inspection. What, what the Secretary of the Navy will direct is two officers to proceed down the river. Now Herndon will be the senior member. There he is in that familiar, now familiar uh, photograph. And Lardner Gibbon, midshipman later commissioned, uh, Lardner Gibbon uh, will be uh, his partner in this exercise. Although for much of the survey of the river, the two will be traveling alone. And focus on this for a minute. These two men will travel huge distances, thousands of miles down the Amazon and its tributaries, 
in dugout canoes, single dugout canoes, paddled by native paddlers and assisted by a handful of natives in the dugout canoes, otherwise traveling completely alone, collecting specimens, recording impressions, and doing as much scientific data collection as is possible while they travel individually in these dugout canoes down this vast river system. This illustration uh, shows you the extent of the Amazon River system. In May 51, they arrive at Lima. The expedition will begin, the two expeditions will begin in June uh, when both of the officers arrive at what they think is the headwaters of the Amazon. Herndon will travel around this arc, around the down the main stem of the river, all the way to Para on the Atlantic. Lardner Gibbon will travel down a separate tributary system, this red arc here. He will ultimately rejoin, or join, excuse me, the Amazon well downstream and then continue on following, uh, following Herndon. And here you see uh, the, the schedule of Herndon's travel down the river and the extent of it uh, and the dates involved. Herndon will start at what he believes to be the headwaters of the Amazon. This is an illustration of that site uh, right down here and then follow that great arc that I described to you. The actual headwaters, people now believe, is some distance away over here, bottom right, if you can see my arrow moving. But in any case, uh, it is believed at the time, and it doesn't change the effect of the story at all, that the headwaters are here. He will arc around this vast arc and head out uh, towards the South Atlantic. Uh, his, his reports on, on what he does, where he goes, and how he gets there are exhaustive. They're complete. And it astonishes me that under the circumstances I described to you, riding in a dugout canoe uh, with, with a handful of, of local people helping him move the canoe down the river and, and stay out of trouble, that he is able to collect the data that he has been directed to collect, to collect specimens live, a dead, inert, mineral, and other, uh, collect specimens, and to conduct this expedition as successfully as he does. This is representative of the maps uh, that come out of this effort. Uh, this is Lardner Gibbons' map, uh, as I, I mentioned to you before, a slightly different route. I want to point out something to you. This is the key to Gibbons' map. And up here in the corner, it, it shows you the extent to which he is collecting information. This, uh, and you can see it on places in the map, this key says he is also recording where gold mines are found or where people are uh, panning for gold, the location of silver mines, mercury, the availability of copper, tin, and lead. All this is recorded on his map, as well as uh, geographical data, and as well as information on, on towns, villages, uh, the current of the rivers and strength in knots and so on and so forth. A brilliant exercise on the part of both men collecting data to prepare the report uh, that they're going to deliver when they finally get done. Okay, this is Gibbon's track. As he comes around, he leaves Herndon here and he begins his own exploration, also by dugout, also by himself along this extent of the river before he rejoins the Amazon and heads out towards the Atlantic. This is just an illustration to make sure you can see that each of these marks show the location of the mineral resources in there. Herndon and Gibbon will produce written reports to the Navy Department containing maps, illustrations, statistical data, recorded observations, along uh, an astonishing range of information. They will also illustrate uh, their reports. These are illustrations from, from Herndon's uh, report, and they're really quite extraordinary. Uh, it's possible he was an artist. Uh, 
clearly had artistic talents, but it's also possible he used uh, one of these shadow boxes. Uh, camera obscura is what they're officially called. A lens here, light enters through the lens, bounces against a, a piece of paper or a drawing surface there. You look down through this area here. And on this surface is the image of what it is you're seeing through the lens. And it's possible then to draw that with some precision. The thinking is it was exactly the same kind of camera obscura that some of the famous artists of, of the classical times used. This is a painting by Vermeer called The Music Lesson, a young woman at some sort of a stringed uh, piano instrument. And it is believed that that was done by the artist through the use of one of these camera obscures, looking at the scene, sketching it out, and then making a painting. What Herndon and Gibbon are able to do, however they did it, is to evoke the peoples, the places, the countryside, uh, the features with startling clarity. And it must have just been striking to a society like, uh, like that in Washington to see these illustrations of life uh, in Peru, life in the Amazon uh, drainage basin, wildlife, people, uh, all sorts of images that illustrated, as well as the maps and, and other information did, that illustrated their experience. Herndon will come down the Amazon. Uh, he will join the main stem of the Amazon just past the city of Manaus and then proceed to Para on the Atlantic. Uh, if you have traveled on the Amazon yourself, perhaps on a cruise ship, perhaps some other way, uh, in the days when such travel was much more possible than in the era of COVID, uh, I'm certain that you have been at Manaus, which is the obvious uh, interior resting place, visiting site. It is where the Rio Negro, the Black River, joins the main stem of the Amazon. There's a city here. Uh, it has been a city important uh, for centuries because of the uh, market for rubber, natural rubber. Uh, it is said that uh, during the 19th century, Manaus was so wealthy that its most prosperous merchants sent their laundry to Paris to be washed and pressed before it was returned to them. It is also the improbable site, even improbable still, the improbable site of an opera house. Uh, years ago, Susie and I found ourselves in Manaus and toured that opera house and sort of marveled that here in the heart of Amazonia was this elegant theater uh, for the entertainment of, of cultivated people. They will return with all sorts of specimens and samples, as well as written reports. Some of those specimens will be eaten by others of their specimens. They bring some living uh, things back to them, but not particularly successfully. But ore samples, uh, fur samples, feather samples, uh, agricultural samples. Uh, it is a, a massive and entirely successful effort to collect data, to record data, uh, to amass information about what is possible, what is alive, on the, in the valley of the Amazon and what is possible to live there and the economic part that that valley could conceivably play in the business of the United States. The report is exceedingly well received, although, as you know, nothing much comes of it, although some Confederates uh, and their slaves and their plantations at the end of the war will relocate, at the end of the Civil War, will relocate uh, to this part of, of uh, Amazonia. And in fact, there's at least one town in the Amazon Valley, in the drainage basin, that celebrates uh, its southern roots uh, and its Confederate connections uh, annually in a festival. Herndon's story ends impressively, but sadly. You know, of course, that at the same time, uh, this era that I've described to you, the era of naval exploration, naval expeditions, in between the wars, the Mexican War and the uh, American Civil War, you know, of course, that gold is discovered in California. And that discovery launches a, what is described as a rush, what I would describe as a stampede of, of people hunting for wealth and hunting for gold 
westward to the gold fields of California. The illustration here on the left is representative of, <laughs> it's supposed to be representative of one of these men eager to make his fortune in the gold fields of California. He's carrying his, his pans and his shovels and everything else, uh, heading out to the gold fields, a representation there of, of one of them uh, on the right. What this stimulates, of course, is a tremendous boom in traffic. Traffic across the continent heading for California is really difficult. It's a long way. Mountain ranges, specifically the Rockies you see on the left there, uh, get in the way. The travel is very difficult. Easier travel is by sea. And it's commonly accomplished by sailing down the coast, getting to Panama, crossing the isthmus uh, there, and then heading up to San Francisco by ship, disembarking from ship there, heading into the gold fields, and reversing that, hopefully carrying uh, gold with you on the way back, but most often not, reversing that either by sailing around the Cape and back into the Atlantic, or more commonly or more, more easily, going across the Isthmus of Panama, riding the new railroad, the, the sort of Tunerville trolley that runs across the Isthmus and then boarding another ship and heading for uh, the U.S. East Coast and to sell your gold. Famously, the sidewheel steamer Central America sailed that route from the east side of the Isthmus uh, heading towards New York City in 1857. Her connection to this story is that in command of steamer Central America, new name, she sailed for the most part under a different name earlier, is Herndon, now uh, out of the Navy uh, for a time anyway. The Navy doesn't have enough ships and enough places for all its uh, officers. So he resigns his commission. He becomes the master of the steamer Central America, SS Central America. And she is steaming back from the isthmus with hundreds of people on board, men, women, children, uh, miners, many of them, and millions of dollars in gold. She will run into, off Cape Hatteras, one of the few serious storms of the 1857 hurricane season. These are several storm tracks that we know of uh, during that 1857 season. And as you'll see, two of them, two of the principal ones, arc around infamous Hatteras, Cape Hatteras, and head out into the North Atlantic, and powerful storms go right, right across the Cape. It is Steamer Central America's fate to be off of Cape Hatteras when one or another of those two Atlantic season hurricanes strikes the Cape, carrying uh, something approaching 600 people uh, steamer Central America is battered by, by the storm. Her, gener her fires will go out, her pumps will go out, and the ship will begin to sink. With Herndon in command, Herndon will succeed in offloading 153 survivors. And they're described in books about the subject largely as women and children and a few men the 425 men who will drown, drown when the storm floods the engine rooms, shuts down the pumps, the ship fills with water, and she sinks. Her captain, Herndon, is reportedly in dress uniform, standing on the bridge as his command, as his ship sinks into the waters of the Atlantic. The wreck was found not terribly long ago identified and identified reasonably easily, I think, uh, from a number of sources, not the least of which is the uh, millions in gold found offshore. Uh, this is an illustration here, these photographs here, show you some of those gold bricks that came off the ship, uh, Central America. Uh, one of those uh, bricks weighed 60 pounds, fully 60 pounds all by itself. Uh, the book on this subject is by Gary uh, Kinder. It's really good. Ship of Gold in the Deep Blue Sea. I invite it to your attention. 
if you're interested in knowing something about the movement of miners and people back and forth to the gold fields in mid 19th century during the great gold rush and something about the perils of sailing at sea in that period. Herndon uh, occupies an important place in, in history and specifically, of course, in Navy history. There have been two ships named after him. There are uh, photographs there uh, on the right of both of those vessels, USS Herndon. There is a monument to Herndon at the Naval Academy. Uh, the picture in the bottom left shows you fourth classmen climbing the monument. It's been greased to make that difficult. There's a, a, a Dixie cup, a sailor's hat on top of the monument. Uh, if they succeed in wrestling their way up to the top of the monument and grabbing that cap and bringing it down, their term as plebes uh, officially ends and they're treated as real human beings at the Naval Academy, a real improvement in life. Herndon is also remembered uh, by Virginians because he is the source of the name of the town of Herndon, Virginia. Town Seal, you see there in the circle, the yellow circle, and that of course is Herndon and the steamer Central America uh, to his right uh, in the seal of the city. I've enjoyed this conversation with you. Uh, I look forward to questions if you have them. The books that have been mentioned in this presentation appear on my website. And Susie, uh, who is the technical wizard uh, in our family, Susie has put them all on the website. So if you're interested in reading about Herndon or any of the other expeditions of excitement uh, that I've described to you in monologue, uh, please go to that website and take a look at it. Uh, the library has been kind enough to mention to you in the uh, publicity att attached to this talk that I'm an author. I am. Uh, I've written seven books on various events in, in maritime history. Uh, ADAC is the story of an aircraft ditching at sea off the Aleutians, uh, the loss of the aircraft and what happened to the crew when they were saved by Russians. Sailors in the Holy Land, we've already talked about the expedition to the Dead Sea. The last Lincoln conspirator is the story of the assassination of Lincoln and uh, what happened to Mary Surratt's youngest son who escaped uh, tri arrest and trial and was captured finally in Egypt. Alexander Egypt and returned to the United States for trial for his part in the assassination. Horrible shipwreck is the story in 1833 of the loss of a female convict transport heading from London to the penal colony in Australia. Congo, uh, you, another U.S. Navy story, a young sailor sent up the Congo River to find out the commercial advantages that might be possible to the United States in that uh, heart of Africa. Black Rock and Blue of Water is the death of a mail ship, uh, a steamer uh, in the Virgin Islands during a hurricane. Embassy to the Eastern Courts, a rather strange uh, U.S. diplomatic mission uh, to Asia to open markets uh, closed to the United States as a consequence of the Civil War. I continue to write, there'll be a history of the armored cruiser Tennessee uh, published by the University of Alabama Press sometime next year, but uh, we can't do much about that now. It, it's not available. I thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to responding to questions either right now or uh, in any way that you want to get a hold of me uh, through the website would be my suggestion. So. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat box. We did have a few questions come in during the presentation. One of them is, what, if any, diplomatic activities did the U.S. enter into with the various countries preceding the different expeditions? Uh, I'm going to give you a very general answer because uh, there's a whole range of activities. There were contacts between our government uh, and the host government, so to speak, but there wasn't a whole lot of attention paid to that. A lot of this was unilateral. The, 
Uh, the best example of that unilateral activity, of course, is the U.S. Uh, opening of Japan, opening in quotation marks. Uh, there was no prior consultation. The, the black ships arrive offshore and, and we go from there. Uh, this was generally the style. Once you had your people on the ground where they were going, the observations uh, in Chile, for example, you then, uh, the, the senior American would approach uh, the, some resident, some host, uh, and, and open the discussions about what they were doing, what they wanted to do, what kind of cooperation they wanted, uh, what they were prepared to do in exchange. Uh, these were pretty much unilateral activities. They were not, uh, they were not exercises in, in 21st century diplomacy. Okay. Thank you. Another question is, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this specific topic and a little bit about how you researched it? Uh, this particular one as opposed to uh, naval history in general? Uh, or both, yeah. Okay. First, the sources for research are really very, very good, beginning with the fact that Herndon, uh, Gibbon, uh, the United States Navy, uh, wrote extensively about uh, the expedition. The reports are very complete. Uh, they're available in, in archival form from the Library of Congress and from the National Archives. Very easy to read. Uh, there are books, uh, modern books that have been published uh, that carry the same information as I suggested to you, uh, some of the titles. Uh, what interests me about it, I spent uh, 24 years as a naval officer. Uh, the history uh, and uh, came into the Navy as a as an undergraduate history major, uh, left it as a as a major in politics and international diplomacy. So history was naturally fascinating to me, and the history, uh, naval history, and maritime history more generally, uh, were subjects that then and still commanded my attention. Uh, the Navy's tradition of maintaining logbooks on ships for everything they do is, I think, the origin for the very careful documentation that a lot of expeditions and explorations that naval forces do are so well uh, recorded because there is this tradition of every couple of hours writing down what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how is it going. Um, Francis, the uh, uh, Dead Sea expedition, wonderfully documented with great precision. Every time they stopped, they, they took uh, measurements and investigations of the boiling point of water, for instance, to establish the elevation they were at. There was a survey conducted throughout his arrival in the Holy Land, his transit to the Sea of Galilee, and down, uh, down the winding Jordan River. There's a beautiful map of the Jordan in his books. And then across the Dead Sea and back across uh, to the Mediterranean to meet supply. So that tradition of, of log books and documentation and reporting to seniors is what underlies, I think, a great deal of the careful recording of history on these expeditions that I've described here. The log books really are quite fascinating when you're able to look at them and just see how detailed they are and everything they they jotted down and thought to track. It, it's more than fascinating, it's exciting. when I. I sit and I read the logbook of the armored cruiser Tennessee. That is the the actual book in which uh, the last days of Tennessee. She was called Memphis when she finally went aground. Uh, that is the actual document that was being prepared by the member of the crew, the responsible member of the crew, at the time these things were happening. And it's well, I, I don't want to overdo it. It's not like a the Holy Grail or a piece of the True Cross, but it's thrilling to know that this is the authentic document in the words of the person living through that moment at the time. And it's accessible to us uh, as researchers or, or for that matter, as just people interested in how come it came out the way it did, which is the fundamental question that I think historians address. Exactly. You mentioned your upcoming book. Is there anything else you're working on or researching right now? There is. Uh, I'm writing a memoir. Uh, for the moment, uh, it is taking the form of a history of the world for the last 80 years. I'll be 80 in January. 
uh, I can't let that happen. It's it's out of control. And I've been talking as recently as over lunch with Susie about how do we scope this memoir so people can uh, can grasp it. Uh, very briefly, I am uh, a survivor of the Holocaust. I came to the United States at the age of four. I've lived here ever since. Years in the Navy, years in private industry, happily married for decades, uh, two adult children, near adult, I don't know, adult grandchildren as well. And what I'm trying to do is answer the question to me, uh, how did it come out this way? And I'm looking both at, in my life, which was up until very recently closed to me, my my mother and grandmother, the only survivors of the war, never told me anything about any of it. And uh, I'm trying to figure out how come it came out this way and what do I think about it? And that will likely, uh, given, as I say, the fact that I'll be 80 in a few weeks, and that'll likely be the last book I do. But uh, it's been a great ride up until now. Well, that definitely sounds like some fascinating and very personal research. So we look forward to you sharing it with us. <laughs> we'll see. We, we did have a question come in about the presentation. How did the explorers on the Amazon com combat the mosquitoes during the explorations? You know, they don't even write about it. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, they had, they were not completely healthy throughout, uh, although they came back uh, in apparent health and lived uh, for years thereafter. But there's very little discussion of that, and I can only assume that they swatted flies like the rest of us did. Um, but it's a, it's a great question, and obviously, the tradition of that valley is that it's it's disease laden, all sorts of uh, itches and horrors and rots and things. But uh, uh, they lived long enough on their return to suggest that uh, they left in fairly good health, uh, absent modern medical intervention. Obviously, no medical intervention. The, the other interesting thing is they weren't injured. This is pretty dangerous stuff. They're moving uh, through all kinds of terrain, down mountain slopes and uh, across riverine waters and things of the sort. Uh, it's a setup for physical injury and not just simply uh, disease. And that didn't happen either. Uh, they either were very capable or very lucky or a combination of both. Um, obviously, if anything had happened, we'd never know about it because uh, there are reports and would have died with them, then that would have been the end of it. Um, but that's a that's a good question, and it's an interesting thing to think about. Well, that is all of the questions for today. Thank you again for joining us, and we will see you in a few weeks for your next presentation. Sure, I, I invite people to join us in, in talking about the lightship cross rip. Uh, I will introduce that in one sentence now, only by saying. Uh, don't believe what you read about it. It turns out that uh, that didn't happen. And we'll leave it at that. And uh, I look forward to speaking to, uh, to everybody in a few weeks' time. And thank you for your very great support, as always. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.